Welcome back to the Almost Shameless Podcast with Tanya Ray Fox. I am your host, Tanya Ray Fox. This week has been so full of sports, so full of great topics to talk about, which works out well because this is another solo podcast. Originally, I was going to do a guest, um, but they are going to be next week. So look forward to my first um, episode with a guest in a while next week. I'm not going to tell you who it is yet, but I will end up putting it out on Twitter and Instagram before next week's episode. So look forward to that. But this week, it's all me. You get all me again. And I have to tell you, I'm fired up today. So I am live on the podcast. going to pour myself a seltzer. Can you hear that? That sounds like a sound effect. Wow. Amazing. Now this is a seltzer of the hard variety because it's literally five o'clock somewhere because I'm on the West coast. So I'm always, you know, ready to go. This has been a wild week. I don't know how many of you are soccer fans, but I love the euros. I love soccer. I have a soccer topic for you today, and I promise you it's not a boring, like, X is no soccer topic. It has to do with soccer in America. It has to do with other sports. We got no wild debate on Twitter today in anticipation of this topic, so I'm going to share all of it with you. We've got NFL and NBA mixed into that topic, so, like, I'm telling you, this is for you. This is not an inside soccer conversation. We're also going to talk about what the hell, I want to break down what it is that Roger's is up to what his motivations are in essence title of the topic is really going to be what does Aaron Rodgers want what does he want we're going to get into it and I'm not going to be I'm going to be harsh with him I'm going to be honest I'm going to be harsh with him but we have to start off this week talking about a guy I have vehemently defended uh, on Twitter and no it's not Cam Newton we're going to talk about Nikhil Harry because this week He got himself into, he, this was not his best look. Let's just say that. So we're going to talk about Nikhil Harry. I'm always going to start this podcast out with a Boston topic if I can, because I know that that's what you guys want to hear. And to be quite honest, like it's a big story in the NFL right now. I mean, I think it's bigger has to do more with Bill Belichick and what it says about him and the team and the state of the team right now than it does necessarily with Nikhil's star power, because we know that's not, you know, that's not it. Uh, but we want to get there before we get to all of that, before we get to the topics, can I just say being back in a normal feeling summer post like the height of COVID, I know that COVID is still going on, get your vaccines, do what you need to do to keep yourself, to keep yourself safe. But being back into like the swing of summer, I'm finding myself so antsy to get out and get going that I almost get overwhelmed and end up doing nothing. I have binged more Netflix in the last week than I probably did like at, you know, in in one sitting than I probably did in any time during 2020. I don't know what it is, if it's the warm weather or whatever, that's making me lazy, but I like, whoa, I wasn't ready for having options for having social options. So this has been a little bit of a journey for me. Um, I don't know if you guys ever saw that show, the 4,400 it's on Netflix. It like, it was out on network television in 2004 or five. I think it went until 2007 and it was on the same time as lost on ABC. I don't know what network this was on, but I loved lost. It's like one of my favorite shows of all time. I loved it so much. I was a little late to the ball game. Um, I didn't start watching it until like two years after it premiered, but I've never heard of this show and all the seasons are on Netflix and it's like crazy to watch because you can tell that there's been like 4 million different television shows ripped off of this TV show. And I'm not saying this TV show has totally original ideas, but there's so many TV shows in the last like 10 years specifically that seem to be pulling almost directly from this show's plot line and their like overall theme. That's like kind of crazy. So while it's a little slow at times at points because it's network from the early 2000s I'm actually really liking it so if you like lost or manifest or the leftovers or any of those kinds of shows binge the 4400 on Netflix it's good it's worth it um anyways that's my rant before we get into everything I swear I'm not procrastinating this topic let's go let's do it let's get into Nikhil Harry so earlier this week Nikhil Harry announced that he wants a trade from the New England Patriots Former first round draft pick, honestly, 
a really high profile draft pick for Bill Belichick. He went and got a receiver in the first round, uh, something he doesn't normally do, nor is he well known for his ability to draft receivers. So this was a big deal. He reportedly went outside of some of his scouts to do this. They weren't necessarily on board with this. And Belichick was like, no, this is my guy. I'm going to get my guy. And now this was in the last year of Brady. I don't know where he was at in terms of contract negotiations with the Patriots at that point. I don't know if Belichick had a feeling that Brady was going to leave after that season or not, but he was definitely trying to get the offense in good shape. He drafted offensive line and running back the year before drafts Nikhil Harry. Like he's trying to do everything he can offensively. So here we are two years later, just two years later, he hasn't even played a third season in the NFL yet. And he's already requesting a trade. Now the trade request itself is one thing for a guy in his position who doesn't have any trade value and who, you know, when you spend a first round pick on somebody, you can't just send them off with no trade value. It doesn't, it just doesn't look good. And for a guy as who's as good of a GM as Bill Belichick is, it's a real mark on your resume when something like this happens, if you have, end up having to deal a guy like that. So it's kind of a wild trade request to begin with, but it's the statement made by his agent. That is really the, the craziest part of this that I really want to dig into because this statement is insane. I'm just going to read you a couple of the sentences from the statement. For two seasons, he has 86 targets, which obviously hasn't met the expectations the Patriots and Nikhil had when they drafted a dominant downfield threat who was virtually unstoppable at the point of attack in college. Okay. Uh, Nikhil understands a key ingredient to production is opportunity. Okay. Those are the two things I want to kind of focus in on here. Now, first of all, for an agent and a player to tout their college abilities after the difficulties that he's had in the NFL is really insane to me. Every single wide receiver in the NFL that was drafted in the first or even second rounds was a top tier talent in college. Any single wide receivers agent could write that statement and say they were dominant probably downfield because it's college football in college there that doesn't mean anything you were first round draft pick you have to produce in the nfl secondly opportunity now i'm on record as saying i really don't think he's had the opportunities that he needs to show what he's capable of i think we saw some really good moments from him especially like a couple times his rookie year there were these big moments on the sideline whatever contested catches which is what he's good at but it's one thing you know brady was kind of one foot out the door in 2019 i don't think it set anyone up on the offense for much success i think that offense was stagnant and kind of old and stale and then that you know and then that same group by and large was what they rolled out for Cam Newton last year during that crazy season. It was really difficult. Cam Newton coming off an injury, whatever, but can't, you know, I really did expect Nikhil to step up with someone like Cam who has a good arm, who can throw downfield. Um, Even with his arm being hurt last year, and he had minimal downfield throws, but the ones he did have were good. He was on target. And if you're going to be a big guy, who's a contested catch guy, whatever, and you can't get separation in the NFL, the opportunities are going to come in those moments where, where you need to make a high risk, high reward throw. And there just haven't been that many moments where Nikhil has proven that he can step up. Now, do I feel like they've used him downfield enough? No. But again, where do you think you're going to go that the opportunities are going to be so much better? You know, the Patriots are set up for more success now in this offseason than they've been in the last two because of where they're at health wise, because of the new blood that they brought in on on the offense, because of the state of their defense, which has a great mix of veterans who came in as free agents, veterans who are already on the team and young guys who've been drafted really well on that side of the ball. So, you know, to me, it almost seems like he's getting some bad advice from obviously his agent. I don't know, you know, I know he's raised by his grandmother. I don't know if, you know, what kind of conversations he has with his actual family, but someone's giving this guy some really bad advice. (laughs) Number one, like Bill Belichick has say what you want. He's the guy who took a chance on you. He's the guy who was told not to draft you when he did. So I'm not sure how many teams around the league value Nikhil more now than Belichick did when he drafted him. And secondly, like at some point you have to go prove yourself. And this is an offense 
that in a second year with Cam Newton, whether it's Cam that gets the start or even Mac Jones, that is set up, obviously set up for more success than they were last year. It just feels like a really misplaced, you know, blame game. And I'm not sure that this is going to work out for anybody. It's not definitely not going to work out for the Patriots if they end up having to put their first round draft pick from two years ago on waivers or trade him for something, you know, for pennies on the dollar. And I really don't see it working out for Nikhil Harry, like, you know, having to start into a whole new offense and everything else. I mean, I'm not saying that Josh McDaniels and Bill Belichick are the perfect team for every single player and in every single situation, but come on, like give it one more year. What are you doing? Give yourself a chance to be traded for real at, like you're not a trade piece right now where you're at. Like it's embarrassing. Um, you know, and on the flip side, this is a tough look for Bill Belichick because not only did he put himself on the line to go get Nikhil and put his reputation on the line, knowing what everybody says about his ability to draft wide receivers, uh, scout wide receivers, you know, more specifically, he went and got this guy and he's not cut. Like he's not, you know, he's, he's been riding with him. He's been giving him chances and he has a chance in training camp to kind of make his mark when he goes out on a limb for a guy, they always have a little bit more leeway. And we've seen that with McKeel. And, you know, I do still see potential in his game. I mean, I definitely don't think he's the receiver. I thought he was going to be when they drafted him. I was really excited when they drafted him because I lot, I watched a lot of Arizona state and pac 12. He really was an exceptional talent. And I should have known better because I'm also the same person who always points out the fact that that most defensive backs in college are just like not even close to capable of playing in the NFL. And especially in the Pac-12, it's just, I, I should have, I should have been more skeptical, but I saw enough of the flashes of what I'd seen before in the year, you know, in his first year that I was optimistic. And I think that there's something there, but in order to get an opportunity like what he's looking for, which is more targets and more chances to make a name for himself, he can't go be the third or fourth string guy on a different team. Like this is the team where if you want to work yourself back up the depth chart, this is the place to do it. Going somewhere else where their one, two, three, four guys are already installed in place and thinking you're going to make some huge improvement Um, I mean, like, where are you going to go? I mean, I guess if you go to like Kansas city or the Rams or prolific passing offense, like I, you know, in a lot of ways, this makes me really wonder if Nikhil's impression is that Cam Newton is going to be the quarterback this season. If the team's pretty convinced that at least to the start, Cam Newton's going to be the, the starting quarterback this season. And so he sees this as more of a power running offense. And he doesn't think he's going to get the chances for him to, you know, grow, which I think that's a little overstated. They're going to run a lot. It's a Cam Newton offense, but in a, in a well-run Cam Newton offense, he's also throwing downfield a ton. And that's what you you're saying that you want. So none of this makes sense. It's a bad look for the organization in terms of like their ability to manage these high draft picks. It's a bad look for Nikhil Harry. It doesn't seem like he fully understands where he fits in right now. And I understand that. I don't think it's, you know, I don't think that's a crime, but I also think that at some point you have to have some self-awareness and understand that there's going to be times when you have to prove who you are. I mean, Jesus, look at what Julian Edelman did to work himself into the role that he got from where he was. Like, this is the, this is the curse of the first round draft pick, right? You come into the league with the entitlement of being a first round draft pick, but you know, it doesn't always work out that way. Sometimes you do have to grind. So we will see, but I sure do. I mean, geez, it, it sure does seem like he's not optimistic that there's going to be a, a pro a, a high number of passes this season for him to compete for. So, you know, different topic, but there might be, that might be a little bit of information on where he thinks the quarterback position is going to go to start the season. Okay. We have to have a discussion about what the hell Aaron Rodgers is doing. Now, I have flip-flopped on Aaron Rodgers as a quarterback just flat out, probably more than any quarterback I've ever watched. He is so hard to pin down in terms of like 
where his ceiling is, you know, when he has down seasons versus like last year having an MVP season, I just have a really hard time tracking where he's at in his career. And I always have. I also don't think that he is, you know, there's, there was a time not long ago where he was considered, you know, kind of like a co-goat. And you guys, I'm sure remember the primetime football game in the 2018 season, they had Brady versus Rogers with the two goats. And I just, at the time recall thinking that's absolutely insane. And I'm sure I tweeted and talked about it, but in, you know, now it, it really does look even crazier considering Brady's once again, not only, you know, won another ring during Aaron Rodgers MVP season, but beat him on the way to doing it. It just, it sort of sealed the deal. And you can see that Brady winning had a ripple effect on not just Aaron Rodgers, on Russell Wilson and other quarterbacks in the league who are like, what do we have to do to get our teams to do for us what the Buccaneers did for Brady? And I think that's some pretty full, I think that's some, I think that logic is flawed because I, what we're seeing in this off season from Aaron Rodgers to me explains everything you need to know about where Rodgers is at with football, which is kind of over it. He won the MVP. He didn't get the response that he wanted from his team in the off season. And he's kind of done. I, you know, he's talented enough to not care, which, you know, Brady, I think the biggest thing that helped him his whole life was that like, he didn't owe it. He's super talented, super smart. Like, obviously I'm not one of those people who's like system quarterback. He understands how to read a defense. He's amazing in the pocket all time in movement in the pocket, but he doesn't have that like natural arm and that natural athleticism that Aaron Rodgers came into the league with. And you see this sometimes with those types of quarterbacks, like they just, they want you to think that they have that work ethic. They want you to think that they could do what Tom Brady does, but they don't. <laughs> they don't. Aaron Rodgers won't even commit to like the full TV 12 diet. He like follows like parts of the TV 12 diet. He jokes around with Tom Brady all off season. They do this whole thing. He gets his ass kicked by this dude in the playoffs in the NFC championship game, takes Aaron Rodgers out of the playoffs, takes his Super Bowl appearance away from him in his MVP season. And all Aaron Rodgers done is all off season is like fuck around with Tom Brady. They're joking on Twitter. They're on, you know, they're on Skype calls. They're, they're in the match and joking around and laughing about how Matt LaFleur kicked it while they were eight points down. Like that's just not the kind of killer competitive instinct that you see from guys who are considered the goat. I don't, it's, it's like, it's almost like he's trying to single white female Tom Brady by like hanging around with him enough and hoping that something rubs off on him all off season long. It's like, he's hosting Jeopardy. He's on Pat McAfee. He's in Hawaii purposely taking all kinds of pictures with Miles Teller and his wife. He's sort of using the new relationship status to get himself out there in the media. He's winking and laughing and smirking and rolling his eyes and at no point in time this offseason have I seen a quarterback who seems like he's desperate to do anything but be done with football and be famous. And I'm not usually one of those people. Like I am not a I'm not a like a shock jock here to rip apart some first ballot Hall of Famer. The guy is an all-time talent. As you know, he has nothing to prove in terms of his ability to play football or his place in the history of the league. But he's got a very small window left to try to win a ring. The Packers roster is in pretty good shape. All things considered, they're looking pretty good. He's done more with less before. He was very close to a Super Bowl last year. And, you know, when Tom Brady has gotten close to a Super Bowl and hasn't made it, his offseason is like hell. He goes hard. He gets pissed. I mean, you guys remember it the year after they lost the Super Bowl to the Eagles, he's not showing up to OTAs. He's doing his own thing. He's doing practice like, but he was making it very clear football was his priority. And he was pissed. He didn't win when he lost, when he's lost to Peyton Manning in AFC championship games, you do not see, there's not like that pouting and foot stomping. And that's, 
I don't know if other people are reading that from Aaron Rodgers, but it's all I see. It feels like just pouting and foot stomping. Like, what more do you want, dude? You're not Tom Brady. You can hang out with him as much as you want. You can do as you can beat him in as many golf matches as you want. It's not going to matter. I just can't really imagine. Like, there's not really an example of this where. that I can think of where someone who is aspiring to do what their competitor is doing spends all off season hanging out with that guy laughing about how he got his ass kicked. You know, Peyton Manning didn't start really, really, really joking about that stuff until his career was over until he was retired until he had his second ring and could say peace out, whatever. And now he's embraced the fact that there's just like, there's just no catching up. There's no catching up. And he has the personality to do that because he's naturally funny, charming, disarming, and doesn't come across as um, aggrieved or pompous or anything like that. And I just don't get that from Aaron. Like I get this like snobby, resentful vibe in every way that he talks about things. And the Packers fans, if I was a Packers fan, I'd be really discouraged by this. Because, you know, as bad as it was with Brady leaving, Brady, he, it was a clean break. One day he was a Patriot, the next day he wasn't. We kind of saw it coming. The house was for sale, the whole thing happening. But he was like, cool, guys, thank you for 20 years. This is amazing. I'm going to go to Tampa. And he just was like, out. This, what Aaron Rodgers is doing to the Packers fans is like a fan's worst nightmare. And after what they went through with Brett Favre, And after all the shit that Aaron talked about how Brett Favre handled him and treated him and how he dragged that whole thing out and retired and unretired and retired and unretired like three, four times for him to be pulling this. It's just like, what happens in those lock? Like what happens once you enter the green Bay facilities and start at quarterback, you just, is there like a room you go in and morph into Brett Favre? Like he's slowly, but surely even like the gray is coming into the beard. It's like, he went to Brett Favre's farm and got like imbued magically with his screw this energy. It's wild to watch. It's so crazy to watch someone become what they once hated. Uh, Although, you know, the reality is he was always a little bit more like Favre than he wanted to admit. I think his obsession with not throwing interceptions is purely about Brett Favre. It's purely about differentiating himself from the guy who came before him because they're both first ballot hall of famers for the same team back to back. So, you know, in Aaron's mind, he's like, I'm kind of a gunslinger. I kind of do the same thing. So how can I not be Brett Favre 2.0? I'm going to throw no interceptions. As long as someone's wide open or clearly able to catch this, as long as it's Jordy Nelson or someone I trust, I'll throw the ball. But if anybody, if there's a defender anywhere near my receiver, it's going into the stands. He's just like, oh, it's just a lot. And it's hard to imagine him coming back from this off season and just like sliding right into the season. Even if he does, even if he does come back to play for the Packers, a part of me just is like how I don't, it's hard to root for you, dude. Like I kind of just want to see Tom Brady keep walloping you until you retire. And Brady's like 47. It's still going. That's kind of what all you've made me feel. And I'm not speaking for Packers fans. I'm sure that they hate everything I'm saying right now, but for me, he just comes across as kind of lame. Like, what do you want? Figure out what you want and just do it and stop making it my problem. Okay. And lastly, I, as I am want to do, started a Twitter frenzy on my own page by suggesting, nay, fully declaring that soccer players have better endurance than NBA players and NFL players. Let me read you the tweet because it really got people going. So I tweeted, is anyone interested in hearing a rant about how fit soccer players have to be and how I'm pretty sure every elite midfielder in the world could destroy your favorite NFL or NBA player in a competition of athletic endurance. Now I didn't say what the competition would be, but I trust that most people with a brain can understand that endurance means just a lengthy amount of time doing cardio. Okay. This is, I don't feel the need to over explain things. I'm going to leave it up to the people to understand what I mean, read between the lines. People, it did not go well. Let me just tell you this. There is a huge difference between bursts of speed throughout a game 
and having to constantly run back and forth for 45 to 50 minutes at a time without any breaks, with, you know, without any timeouts or anything like that. There's a huge difference, which is why I tweeted about this because I've been watching a lot of soccer, as I told you earlier in this episode. And it's really crazy to watch how gassed some of these guys get because they're playing. I mean, I've watched multiple games in the Euros that have been the full, you know, you get 45 minutes in the first half, no stoppage. Then you get stoppage time, which is usually anywhere between two and five minutes. They take the break. They come back for the second half, play another 45 minutes, another two to five minutes of stoppage time. And then they go to an extra time period. And that is two 15 minute halves. Basically, it's not, not much of a break in between the end of the game and the start of extra time. So you've got 15 minutes and then another 15 minutes and whatever stoppage time is in there. So over the course of a, of a full game, a lot of these dudes in the Euros have played anywhere between 90 to 120 minutes of soccer plus stoppage time. And it's just, a, these games are long and taxing. And so did I know what I was doing when I tweeted it? Sure. I'm not going to play dumb. I knew people like, especially in America, because they don't watch soccer, were going to come back at me. And there was a lot of people who kept talking about the bursts of speed you have to have in the NFL and the NBA and like back and forth and really quick and blah, blah, blah. As if in soccer, you're not sprinting down a hundred yard field. <laughs> like the whole thing is that as long, like you're, yeah, there's a lot of passing. There's a lot of like little intermittent runs, but there's also a lot of like the ball's been sent down the field and you better go get it. And this field is as big as a football field and they don't get stops and they don't switch out and they don't go on the bench and they don't do shifts like they do in hockey. Like this is constant grind, especially if you play the whole game. Like, of course, some people don't, there's many players who are substituted, all that stuff, fresh legs, you get it. But this is not like, I did not think that this was like that controversial. If anything, I thought people were going to be like, yeah, like, we don't talk about that enough. I agree with you, blah, blah, blah. You don't have to love soccer. I'm not going to, I'm not here to explain to you the most beautiful game. I'm just here to tell you, like, it's inarguable. So I looked up the stats. I, I, you know, it was a pretty, I would say it was a medium Google search. It wasn't the most in-depth, but like I found enough sources, five, six sources that said essentially the average soccer player is going to run seven to nine miles in a game. Midfielders are going to be on the higher end of that. You know, there are some midfielders who've played an entire game and run over 10 miles in a game. And the average basketball player is running about two and a half. The average football player is one and a half to two. So I point that out. And the response is like, yeah, but like, if you do a a mile and a half in 11 minutes and like, my point is you're not doing a mile and a half in 11 minutes, you're doing 0.3 0.3 miles in a minute and then sitting down and then doing another half mile and in a couple of minutes and sitting down. And it's like the rest periods in between. That's the difference. That's the point of the word endurance. And then I got the people who started talking about marathon runners and cross country runners and boxers for some reason. It's just like, can nobody ha- just read an opinion on Twitter, be like, wow, that's something I haven't really thought of. For some reason, it bothers me, and I don't know why. Maybe I should investigate why that bothers me, because it's really just a fact and not an opinion. And just, like, shut up? No, that was too much of me to ask. My biggest point of contention in this rant is that none of these people watch soccer. You're arguing with me, and you don't watch the sport. You don't watch it. You haven't played it, and you don't watch it. So how are you getting mad at me? I'm not the one watch soccer, (laughs) watch the game and tell me that you think that you have to have the same endurance to play 48 minutes of basketball. By the way, if you play an entire game of basketball, even if you play every single minute, which everyone in America acted like Kevin Durant had just done, had just gone to the moon by playing every minute of a game plus overtime. Okay. Everybody lost their minds. Now granted he's seven feet tall. So impressive, but If you play the whole game, 48 minutes of regulation, you're still getting a break every 12 minutes of game clock. There's not the constant no stop grind of running up and down a soccer field. A lot of what was in my research was that even goaltenders are getting about two miles in because they're, you know, they're still running in and out of the, out of the box. 
So it's just, it was, guys, this is less of a soccer rant and more of a like, get your shit together on Twitter rant. I want to engage with people who know what they're talking about. So if you've never watched soccer or you rarely watch soccer, or you've only ever watched soccer really casually, maybe this conversation isn't the one for you. Maybe you just keep scrolling on the timeline until you get to the Suns topics and the LeBron stuff and the NFL offseason stuff. Just keep going. You don't have to weigh in on shit you don't know about because then it ends up being like a gaslight parade in my comments as if I'm the crazy one for suggesting that soccer players run more. I, I didn't say they don't flop. I didn't say that they aren't as like that they're as tough or that they get as beat up as much. I didn't say any of that. All I said was that they have more endurance. Inarguably, they have to utilize more endurance on a game by game basis in their sport than the other two sports I mentioned. And, you know, people tried to suggest NHL and I appreciate how cardio, like those guys are insane. If you've ever tried to even skate for a full minute at full speed, it's like so taxing. But again, it's so taxing in bursts because they're doing it at, for, you know, a minute, two minutes at a time. And that's why there's shifts in hockey because you can't go at that speed for much longer than that. Again, hockey, a sport where you play 20 minutes and then you're, you get a break every 20 minutes. It was, it's so weird. It is so weird how mad people get anytime you try to say anything about soccer is like more impressive or more interesting, or you even try to make us like a simple comparison to America sports that are more popular in America. People just lose their minds. I mean, there's people like truly in my mentions accusing me of trying, of trying to make people mad. If you're mad <laughs> at this, that's like a wicked you problem that I, I don't know what to tell you. I've never gotten mad about a tweet like that in my life. And I do tend to respond really bluntly, like, but that doesn't mean I'm trying to fight you. I'm going to debate you. And if I think your point is stupid, I'll tell you, you can tell me you think my point is stupid, but you got to back it up and you've got to prove to me you watch soccer <laughs> because if you don't, I am not going to take you seriously. You're already an anonymous person on the internet. You don't have a real name. You don't have a real picture in your bio. Nothing about you is, is, is genuine. You can't come into my comments. Tell me, I don't know what I'm talking about when I'm like a real person who represents myself and owns my opinions on the internet. You know, I watch soccer and talk about it and played it. Like, you know, that if you follow me and you know who I am, what my name is, what I look like, you know, all about me. And you're going to be an anonymous weirdo and tell me you have some sort of like omnipotent knowledge that I don't have. And the first step to arguing with me successfully on Twitter for anyone who cares, put your real name, put a picture of yourself up, start there. Don't be anonymous because I have to be honest, anonymous people's opinions don't matter. It doesn't, you can't go on the internet and shit all over people who are willing to put their name and their faces to their opinions and then hide behind a fake name and a fake photo. Sorry. Your opinion doesn't matter until like I can Google who you are. And that's, you know, and that's on that. That turned into a rant about, you know, about soccer, about fans, about Twitter. I got the trifecta in. I got a full rant of sports, sports fans, and Twitter. That's talent, guys. That's why they pay me the medium bucks. Because I, I bring it all back around. Thank you guys for joining me today. Um, like I said, I will have a guest next week. TBD, um, the announcement will be out earlier next week before the pod comes out. Thank you for coming and listening to me today. If you have any hot takes on anything I talked about, hit me up on Twitter, like I said. Uh, if you don't know what you're talking about, just preface that. Just say, I don't know what I'm talking about. And, and I will give you the pass. But if you don't know what you're talking about and I figure that out and you just yell at me, I'm very liberal with the block button. Um, otherwise, you can totally debate me. You can tell me I'm stupid and tell me why, as long as you have a good reason. Even if I don't agree with it, I'm, I, I promise you, we will, we will move on to better days. You have no idea how many people I've followed after we had a Twitter argument because they were able to like just kind of get into it with me and chill. It's like the best feeling in the world. I respect anybody who can argue with me and then just kind of chill and be okay and just like not lose their minds. So if you can do that with me, like you will earn a follow for me because I really do love that. 
So hit me up on Twitter, talk to me about what you think. And, and we will be back next week with another episode of Almost Shameless. 